Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In my choice to develop my loving self question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, My Choice to Develop My Loving Self. Recorded on the 28th of May, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, so let's do a QA and a on that subject, My Choice to Develop My Loving Self. Um, can we keep our questions on topic, please? Be, be good. Thanks. If we go to Jada at the back and then come down to Ben, across to Teresa. So far away, my friend. Um, I was just wondering, you just had here, unloving desire opens my heart to reception of evil. Yes. I was just wondering a bit about that. Well, whenever we have an unloving desire, basically it's a prayer to be fed by unloving things. Does that make sense? Just like, so just like a... A uh, positive desire, a loving desire, is a is a prayer to be fed by loving things. So, to uh, an unloving desire, is a prayer to be fed by the unloving thing. And so, so what happens is that we attract evil under those circumstances. And this is the trouble with us living in our addictions, because most of our addictions are unloving desires. And this is why we have a tendency to attract a lot of evil when we're living in our addictions. Does that make sense? Are you talking about like evil spirits when evil... I'm talking about evil, evil attitudes, society? evil concepts, yeah. evil ideas, evil people, evil spirits, mm -hmm. anything. And, and evil, let's define as a person who has a purposeful intention to be unloving. Yeah. So an unloving desire within myself causes me to attract people, events, situations that have a purposeful intention to cause me more pain. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, ben, where's next? Uh, this is a clarification about the shades of grey yep. and about yourself. Yep. Is it accurate? Is this accurate? That thinking, feeling, and acting, they can be mixed up and contradict each other. Sorry, embellish uh, further so uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, it's about the parts of the soul, uh, and so all. Even though you might have things coming from your facade and from yourself and it's all like that. Yeah. Is essentially what you are and what you do and feel and everything just I wrote a simultaneous unified expression. It's all one it's all you. Yes, it's you at the moment. And this is where we get hung up, right? We we sort of sort of most of us have been taught to believe that as we are at the moment is how we will always be. And this is one of the reasons why we have a large tendency to suppress pain and, and, and live in facade, because, because we feel that this pain is how we'll always be. We always will be that way. And, and we also have a large tendency to suppress our real self too, because, because of the same reasons. We think that the undeveloped self is how we'll always be. Right, so, so we have a lot of belief systems about us being what we are right now. See, the, and, and the way I see emotion is different to that. Emotion is just the expression of what you are right now. That will change from moment to moment, in fact. One, one moment it will be one thing and one moment you'll do another. And sometimes you'll do even contradictory things one moment for the next. And that demonstrates to you that you're swinging between different states, right? And that can lead you to what you need to heal and... All of that. Of course. This yeah. is why it's so important to be what you are right now, no matter what you, what, what you are is yeah. right now. Yes. Does that make sense? It does, yes. So instead of trying to put a, a, a pretty picture over the top of it. Yeah, or identify all the minu minutia. Of everything. You are what you are. Yeah, be what you are, because that's the way you'll identify what you are the fastest. That, that's the fastest method to identify what you are, is to be what you are, and then realise, oh, you know, maybe this can be changed. Maybe this isn't so loving. This is what I am right now. But, and this is where I see many of you making big mistakes because you're always trying to sort of share your facade and that's not you being what you are right now. And the problem with not being what you are right now is you're not going to identify what you are where, when it's unloving and what you are when it's loving because you're too busy trying to be something different. 
and sharing sharing your facade is really controlling of what you are. Yeah. 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 And and controlling how others perceive what you are. Yeah. And even how you perceive what you are. So you're, control, you're tr controlling your environment through that. And not only that, you're controlling your own perception of yourself. You'd be far better off connecting to your emotions and feeling what you are and then just being that person and then working out, wow, I just, did, oh, I just wanted to do a pretty unloving thing there and that tells me what I am right now. Yes. But it's only what I am right now. Yes. What I am can be changed. So this is where we, don't, we need to stop judging it as well and going, uh, the reason why we have a tendency to judge is because we believe that what we are right now is what we'll always be. And, and we want to deny that. We want to deny what, we'll, what we think we'll always be and so we try to make out with something different. Yeah, and that yeah. thing when you grow older, you're, you're, the whole change thing, you resist the change, I'm going to stay like this now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All those beliefs and everything. Yeah. And we've been told over and over, Ben, that you know, what we are right now is what we'll always be as well. It's just a, it's a terrible thing to tell a person because, it's, because basically it tells them that they can't change. Uh, and the reality is all of us can change. Like I, you know, I, every person I know in this letter of heavens has changed. <laughs> so, you know, every, per, every person who's ever become one with God has changed. So, so change is a normal fact of life, in fact. But, but when we're told this, and, when we t and we even tell ourselves this, but when we're told that you know, we can't change, we're going to be what we are right now, that then makes us afraid to be what we are right now. Because we think, oh, I just wanted to do that, and I just wanted to do this, and that's not very nice. If that's what I am right now, then that's disgusting. I, and then we start judging it, we start attacking it and disapproving and of it. you feel it's a wrong thing if that... Yeah. You feel wrong about that. Yeah. So what we need to do is to learn to just be what we are right now. Hey, baby. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but she's have to say hello. <laughs> You're trying to sneak in. Um, so Mary's just arrived for those on the video, <laughs> if you don't know that already. Yeah, so, so the key is to learn to be what you are right now, warts and all, as the saying goes. And just a matter of... Uh, clarifying truth. Yep. Did I understand yesterday you said our souls aren't actually split? Yeah, that's right. Our souls are. One, our soul is one soul, and it's just an emotional split at the moment. We, even though we have two well, no, bodies two, here. Remember, he said yesterday. There's two reasons for the split. One reason is 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 to do with the fact that we haven't received God's love. So that that a soul can't enter the soul union state without God's love. So that's one reason why it's split. The other reason is because of all the emotional beliefs we have that cause a separation between the two halves. But that's not physically separated. No, it's a, it causes an a separation in awareness. So my question I was thinking of last night is how is my soul here around my body but also over where my partner is? Yeah, it is, yeah. How physically it's not <laughs> separated? That, well, well, no, you see... You, no, you think of yourself as separated. Like, see, this is the trouble of talking about dimensional existences in a, t in a three-dimensional state. It's very difficult to, for you to gather it from a, from a mathematic, I suppose from a mathematical concept. But the reality is it's, it's definitely possible mathematically to be in the same space as though you're separated by space. Yes, so, okay. so, so say in the to to for your soul to encompass energetically those two things, that, the two great. halves. No, that's great. I just wasn't sure if I was all. Yeah. And just lastly, you know, you're talking about the thousands of bodies we can eventually produce once you're. Um, can I just rewind to the previous one? Hmm. Um, this is what it's like, really. Here's your soul, and it, there's an energetic energetic connection between your soul and your spirit body and your soul and the other spirit body, in your case, and this it, you could call a golden cord. Uh -huh. And then there's an energetic connection between that spirit body and the physical body. And that's called a silver cord. And the energy flows. So your soul can actually be in a different location even and still be controlling your body it's just your perception that you're here yeah i just had the 
conception that it was physically me around me right now. Energetically, that is the case. There is an energetic flow around your entire body, which is controlled by your soul. But it's through this cord, I suppose you could call it. Yeah, and I got caught up with the size things, like we're a peanut or a world size thing, and like. <laughs> yeah, like I said, many of you will get caught up with the diagrams and yeah. start, to start to misapply it. So you just have to be careful there. <laughs> and so I was wondering why. Um, but these are all off-topic questions, Ben. It is okay because yeah, I'd like to talk about this topic. Yeah. So you have to send those questions in. Uh, we were over at Teresa. Okay. Um, hoping this isn't off topic. Um, you, when you were talking to Kel and Bruce before yep. about their codependent addictions. Addictions and how they were preventing their real selves from being yep. expressed, yep. Yep. Um, what came up for me was my, my partner um, not being aware of any of this material yep. and not really mm, being a bit, not really wanting to know about it. I mean, he sort of does yep. a bit. Yep. Would it be if if a, when I want to go into it, um, is it loving to to him to exp- well, to both of us for me to explain no. to him what I'm doing or just no. just do it? If he doesn't want to know, it's not loving for him to explain it. Well, he doesn't want to re- like sit down and watch a video or something. But he we do talk about it. Well, if if he wants to talk about it, then it's loving to talk about it. But if he doesn't want to talk about it, it's not loving to talk about it. Yeah. But that doesn't change you being yourself. No, no, I mean, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. No, but Teresa, you would like to use it as an excuse to not be yourself. You, this is what I see people doing in partnerships. They constantly go, I've got to convince the other half to go along with me. Right? That is already out of harmony with love. Yeah. That desire is out of harmony with love, driven by addictions, in fact, and driven by pain and fear. fear yeah. And it's very much out of harmony with love. If, a, if the other party doesn't want to go along for the ride with you, that doesn't stop you from going along for the ride. But you know what? The majority of us go, if he's not going to go along with, on the ride with me, then I'm not going to go on the ride. Mm, I know. And, and that's, I am scared that I'm going to do that. I agree. You're scared, but you're unwilling to process the emotion of scared about that. And that's why you keep asking questions about your partner rather than about you. Mm-hmm. And you do do that. Yeah. You keep asking questions about your partner rather than about you. And that indicates that you're unwilling to see it as your fear and to process through your fear. You want him, you want me to tell you how to make him come along with you. And if you can't make him come along with you, what do you think I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to make him come along with you. Yeah. It's unloving to do so. It's unloving even for you to attempt that. So what I'm suggesting is the reason why we do that is because we are terrified of us taking the positive action, the loving-based action, becoming our real selves and our partner not wanting us anymore, yeah. not understanding what we're try- trying to do. That's what mm-hmm. you're terrified of and you don't want to feel that, which is the reason why it's driving you to ask the question over and over again because you have asked this question a number of times. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that is the attempt to avoid the fear you have of a potential breakup in the relationship if you go ahead and do it, right? And I'm suggesting to you, whether he's your soulmate or not, your current relationship, if it's in codependent addiction, has to break from what it is. And it has to turn into something different, Mm. something that's more loving. The only way that's going to happen is for at least one of you to begin the process. At least one of you needs to do that. Does that make sense? Yes. So this is about my choice, yeah. not forcing him to make his choice. Mm. You follow? It's about me deciding for myself that, yes, I feel this is the best course of action for me to do. I've educated myself enough to know this is the best course of action for me and him. So I go ahead and do it even if he kicks and screams and says, no, I don't like you doing it. You'd still go ahead and do it and you say, no, I'm doing this for the right motivation. You, now, I can explain it to you, but if you keep yelling at me and screaming at me about it, then obviously I can't explain it to you anymore, but I'm still going to do it. So either we need to, we need to come to some resolution about this problem, otherwise, but, but the reality is you can't force him to do that. You can't even yeah. really discuss it with him unless he wants to discuss it. Yeah, what, yeah I've found that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if you attempt to discuss it, you're actually manipulating so that you don't have to feel yeah, fear, my terror. which is yeah. actually a sinful act 
therefore unloving, therefore will cause pain in the future. Mm. Yeah? Okay. Make sense? Yep. Yep. Thank you. If we go straight behind to Joy and Diana over this side. Um, I think I had an experience recently where I finally got to a stage where I wanted to write a letter to my children about a certain thing that I'd done unlovingly to them. Mm-hmm. And um, and and I got through this I'd, – I'd felt a layer of repentance mm-hmm. and got to a point where I wanted to make it better, yep. which is why I wanted to write the letter. Yeah. And then I just think I hit this um, global terror and just went into a solid state of shock and confusion and inaction for yeah. about 10 days or so. Yeah. And I eventually um, got around to writing the letter. Yeah. And, and I'd look and, at... And Joy, is yes. this a story or is no, this a sorry. question about this? Sorry, it's a question. About, I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, that's, and that's and question. so my, one question is um, the reason it was so difficult was because I was having to share my real self. It's the first time I think I've ever been that real. And where, is that you, where you've actually felt sorry and, and, and exposed that you're sorry to somebody else. Yes. Yep. And, um, and is it scary because you're sharing your real self? That's the first question. It's scary because of the false beliefs that are still inside of you right. about sharing your real self. Okay. Does that make sense? So the, what are the false beliefs? You can identify some of them. Oh. Just by feeling the scared, what, what is the flavour of the scared feeling? What, what does it feel like? That I'll be rejected by all of them. So there's one of your false beliefs, one, that if yep. you're your real self, you get rejected. Yeah. What else? Um, there's another one that you might be manipulated. Yes. Right, which is means that if you're too truthful about something you've done wrong, that somebody will come along and manipulate yep. you, use yep. that thing you did wrong against you later on. Yes. So that's another fear, another yep. false belief. Yep. Right. Any others you can feel? Um, they're probably the two main fears. Yeah. So the key with those is to see that they are false beliefs, they're fears, false beliefs. Yep. The key is to feel them, to feel when when you have exposed yourself in the past and you've been attacked and, and work your way through that emotionally, which means you're grieving about those events. So so that's the only way this fear... Taking action still and having uh, and feeling that kind of fear will get you to that pain and once you release that pain, then the fear will be gone. So what happens is you get to the stage where, you know, when you begin this process, you're very afraid of being your real self. As I said, you're just sort of yeah. picking out the... You know, picking out and and sort of like, you know, little display to the world, and then it's like, oh, close that up again. But but as you work your way through it emotionally, you get the stage where you can just brazenly be, <laughs> not brazenly into in your face, but brazen, just be yourself, and and it doesn't matter to you whether people attack you or or reject you or disapprove of you or you know refuse to believe you or any of those things. That's great because my question, another question was, is it because is it is it the global terror? But you're saying it's it's probably more the false beliefs. Well, no. Remember, I said the global terror is related to being yourself. So yes, it is related to the global terror. It's a it's a it's a facet of of that global terror that you have. It's one of your false beliefs adding up to the feeling that you have that you can't be yourself because if you are, certain bad things will happen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sense? Yeah. It's one of the main reasons, in fact, why a lot of people don't want to repent because they feel that they're going to be taken advantage of when they get into a state of repent- repentance, that people are going to pummel them into the ground. You notice that on, on the planet, don't you? When people actually say sorry, they get hammered, like really hammered. Well, that demonstrates the unloving environment because if a person is truly sorry, people who love would not hammer them. They're already truly sorry. They're already repentant. They don't need to be hammered anymore. Does that make sense? Um, so the fact that we get hammered when we're truly sorry is an indication of the unloving environment that we're living in. Mm. And we're afraid of the unloving environment. That's one of our global fears. We're terrified of violence from the environment, aren't we? Mm. Uh, we were over here at Dyer. <clears throat> um, I, just um, when I reflect on developing an aspiration, mm-hmm. um, 
is an aspiration a tool for developing my desire or is it a different thing altogether? Well, that aspiration is, is desire, isn't it not? Well, I thought it was, but it, is it like the beginning, the, like conception yeah, stages? I suppose of you could say it's the seed of desire, isn't okay. it? It's like, yeah. so, so remember we talked about inspiration versus aspiration. Inspiration is when you need another person to generate your desire for you. Right? Aspiration is when I am going to be responsible for generating my own desire. Now, now that happens automatically physically for the majority of us. So, you know, for example, you get hungry. Now what the aspiration? What's the aspiration there? To be fed, <laughs> isn't it? So there's, a, there's an example of a physical desire ge generated to, and that turns into an action based on the aspiration of hunger, right? Your body's cool to, to it needs more sustenance type of thing. But, uh, but we, we also have these kind of feelings emotionally. In other words, you have a feeling that you want to you know, help another person because they look to be in trouble. Right? So that's an aspiration that motivates eventually you to action because they feel you, know, you, you can help them out. You know, it might be change the wheel of the car or whatever it is that you can help them out. They see you be in trouble and, and you can help them out. Right? There's an aspiration that was developed through the begin that turns into a desire that then take that you take action upon. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. And you can actually uh, tune into certain aspirations or detune from them. And uh, what I'm suggesting is that uh, with loving aspirations, you you want to tune into them. You want to you want to develop them, and you also need to recognise that unloving aspirations cause evil events because they attract situations where people are purposely desiring to harm others and therefore eventually will cause evil events. So either one can cause us, one causes us happiness and the other causes us pain, just depending on what we feed, how we feed the aspiration. So you, the reality is uh, with, with all of these addictions in play, you have many unloving aspirations. And we need to identify, before we'll change them, we, we need to identify them and that is a choice. We're making choices here. It's a choice to develop my loving self by recognising where are my aspirations are unloving and doing something about them. Yeah. yeah, thanks. It's helping me like start to um, understand a little bit what responsibility is as mm. far as desire. So thank you. Exactly. God, from God's perspective, you are completely responsible for your desires. You, you are. It's your desire. You are completely responsible for them. And, and the beautiful thing about that is when you have loving desires, all of God's universe is there to help feed it. You know, God himself, God, God's laws, all there to help feed your loving desire. When you have an unloving desire, what's God's universe doing then? Yeah, it's demonstrating to me that... It's not only demonstrating yeah. to you, it's, it's completely, completely opposing, opposing you. you. <laughs> it's opposing you, does that mean? It's saying, don't <laughs> go that way, don't go that way. That's, that's God's universe. Oh, oh. You know, so when you have an unloving desire, God's universe is opposing your desire. Of course the world it, it will probably support it, but God's universe is not supporting it, it's opposing it. And then, and then when we have a loving desire, God's universe is supporting it, right? And, and helping, encouraging it, right? And so once you start becoming sensitive to that as well, you start seeing the power of engaging God's laws even in a world that doesn't wish to, right? You start seeing how powerful that is as a choice, you know? Yeah, rather yeah. than blaming, <laughs> blaming, you know, that when God's laws are opposing mm -hmm. my unloving actions yep. rather than going, Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, like yeah. that. It's like you're yeah, starting to really start to feel and take responsibility for what yeah. God's showing well, so you. It's a very loving thing that God's doing, isn't it? Creating a whole series of laws that oppose our unloving actions is actually a loving thing. And, and to be frank with you, it's exactly the same thing we need to do with our children. Create a whole heap of loving laws that oppose their unloving actions. Most of us didn't do that when we brought up our children. We just fed addiction, fed, they had fed our addiction. We didn't think or consider whether we were opposing an unloving action or supporting an unloving action. And most of the time our definition of love is totally warped. So, you know, when it comes to our children, we're saying, you feed my addiction and that's a loving action. 
Whereas if, a, if we were truly sensitive to God's laws, if a child started feeding our addiction, we would actually oppose that. We would actually stop them from feeding our addiction. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Can I ask another question like mm -hmm. that's, that, that's just brought up in me? Mm -hmm. um, for somebody like me who, had, um, who didn't have really much opposition um, to developing... Um, to my unlovingness as a child. Yep. Um, so I've your unlovingness was supported. It was supported, yeah. yeah. Which well, I think most people would say yeah. is the case. Okay. I tend to think of like the worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so I've been like reflecting on what actions I can take yep. to start to um, take responsibility for that and... and um, place these sort of restrictions on myself without doing it from a punishing point of view. So, yes. Um, but the better course of action would be to find the reason why you do the... See, see, see it's one thing to restrict sinful behaviour, like, which, which obviously is a positive thing to attempt to do. But the reality is, until you get rid of the, the underlying reason why that behaviour exists, your will is going to be still wanting to do that particular thing. So it's far more powerful to examine the, the, the feeling inside of you that drives that unloving behaviour rather than just restrict the unloving behaviour because it's easier to do that. So what I see a lot of people doing is they, they restrict their unloving behaviour and uh, with varying degrees of success. You know, it's usually not always successful. Um, and they do that because they want to avoid the process of actually finding out why they have the unloving behaviour. So you've got to be very careful. See, this is choice to develop my loving self is all about finding the cause of my unloving behaviour rather than just trying to address the effect of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that requires a different use of your will because th that requires a use of your will to feel the terror and then get to the pain. And this is where most of us, this is why we choose the willpower road. This is why we choose to use our intellect to try to do the other is because we're not, you know, we're not that keen on going down this road to feel pain and feel our terror. And, and it's a major problem for us, actually, because what we're doing then is using willpower to change. And then when we do make a little change on that willpower road, we convince ourselves we're now on the right road and it's nothing to do with God's way. That's just human, human way. That's the human way of progress, actually, to, to force you through self through your will to change. God's way is remove the cause of the change. Right? Now, God's, God's love will remove the cause of the change. So what all I need to do is develop myself to such an extent that I have a longing for God's love that's sincere and I'm willing to repent on that particular area. And that requires a different way of looking at the problem, you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can see how I want to use the other, the shortcut. And I like, it was I'm not just, a shortcut. No, no. It's, it, it, we it's believe like, it is. believe it is. Yeah, yeah but it's not actually. It's a long way around. Yeah the, yeah, the big panic of like, how can I do it another way, experiment with this? It's yeah. like, God, I can't stop doing that. Yeah. Um, and I guess then the natural restriction on my soul evolves through the... Well, you don't even feel it as a restriction. Once you release the cause of the reason why you engage unloving behaviour, the cause no longer exists within you, and so therefore the behaviour is no longer automatic. So remember I said in the presentation that we need to examine the automatic behaviour we have, because that tells us our true desires. Whatever we automatically engage, that's our true desire. And what we need to do is un see what's underneath that desire, what, why, why we're engaging that behaviour automatically. So for the majority of us, we're not praying automatically. right? It's something we have to force ourselves to do. So it's willpower that we're using to pray. Well, what I'm suggesting is that kind of prayer is not going to work. What we need to do instead is we need to allow ourselves to feel the reason why... why you know, I, 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 it's not automatic. And then that's when we go through emotions like, you know, oh, God's a bastard and, you know, God's no good and he's going to just punish me and he's not listening to me and he's not going to, you know, that's when we go through those emotions. Once we go through those emotions, now my will, my will is no longer being used to oppose prayer. 
So now prayer, there's a higher likelihood of prayer being automatic. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we need to take that approach with everything. Yeah. Thank you. That's the way, right? So if we go straight behind. And on this side, uh, we, we are, you are Glenda, are we? No? Straight back. So. Barbara. Loving, <coughs> loving aspirations not acted on. Is that classified as a sin because I'm choosing not to show my true self to the world? Well, obviously, there's uh, it's a sin of a kind, isn't it? It's not it's not a serious sin as serious a sin as actually having an aspiration to do something evil and then doing it, and it's not as serious a sin of. Uh, not having the aspiration at all. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But a, re a true aspiration will certainly motivate you to action. So, so what I would look at, every time I have an aspiration and I'm not motivated to action, what's happening is a... A terror or a fear. Terror or fear is controlling me. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, because there's been many times in my life where I haven't acted upon an aspiration where I thought has been loving. Yeah. And... It it's is, always a terror that's is, controlling yeah, you. Yeah. Always a fear, always a false belief that flicks in and controls you. So you better be honest about those. Where does that belief come from? I want to find the emotion that's underneath that, driving that. I want to get to that emotion and feel that emotion to release it rather than willpower myself into having the aspiration. Yep, and that's what I haven't been doing. So that's, mm. yep, good. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Are self-worth and uh, self-love interconnected, um, in inherently interconnected, or are they slightly different? Um, my, my feelings are that um, they are connected to a degree. You, you've, got to, you've got to feel enough about yourself to love yourself enough. Does that make sense? So you've got to feel you're worth your own love in order to love yourself. So they certainly they certainly are interconnected definitely. But but they they do have different flavors in that self-worth or the pulling down of a person's self-worth is usually because of the way they've been treated by others over a long period of time. So so generally a low self-worth is caused by the way others have treated you. Whereas self-love where, where you love yourself can be, can be developed even though others have treated you badly. Does that make sense? I, I feel that my self-worth and self-love have been slowly, slowly increasing. Yeah. Uh, because I, I know God loves me. But now you're telling a story. Can you see that? Now you're telling a story of your own experience. You had a good question and I answered it. That should be enough. Now you're in addiction. Thank you. Yeah. So let's uh, move on. Where anyone else? Uh, Paul. Thank you. Um, when I um, f feel <laughs> like being my true self present with people, what comes up for me is um, um, th 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 this feeling that I'm bad. Yeah. And and nearly apologetic for being there. Like um, yeah. And yep. um, I understand that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Fire away. What's the question? And I, I'm wondering. It, it seems like that's that that that's what I just need to connect with and and, and be mindful of and love myself enough to be with people, even though I feel. Now again, you're skipping over what the answer for yourself is, Paul. It's like. You frequently do this. My answer to Diana applies to that situation. And what you're doing is you're, you're now saying, I'm going to use some willpower to overcome this particular situation by being mindful. You don't have to be mindful. Your automatic desi desire is to deprecate yourself, to pull yourself down, to feel apologetic for being you. That's your automatic desire. Yeah. Remember, every time we have an automatic desire, we need to find, this is how I really feel. So I need to find what's underneath this automatic desire. Does that make sense? So I have the same desire, and I've, and I've had to try to discover what's underneath the desire. What I've found is underneath the desire for me, there's a various different emotions, one of which was I was afraid of getting attacked by the person for being me. And so that was more of a fear that I needed to feel. Does that make sense? 
Um, and once you feel that particular fear, then you won't be worried about that anymore. And then you'll be yourself without pulling yourself down. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not, the key is to not, it's not about being mindful. It's about having enough awareness to feel what the real feeling is. You want to put yourself down, yeah. right? Feel that feeling. You know that it's out of harmony with love. So instead of trying to change it from a, using willpower, what we need to do is actually use our will to discover the reason why we have it, the reason why we pull ourselves down. What beliefs do we have inside of ourselves that causes us to fall down and feel those? And once we feel those and release those, they won't exist anymore and our behaviour will change. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. It's a very different process that you're attempting to do to yourself. What you're attempting to do is actually what, a, you know, what I've mentioned many times that a Christian would do. When they notice a behaviour that's out of harmony with love, they then become, they use mindfulness as a way of changing that behaviour. But it's not very effective because the underlying cause of the behaviour, which comes from the pain, is still there. And unless you access the underlying cause and release its underlying cause, there will be no real development of your loving self. So you can be mindful and get better and, and appear more loving, but the reality is while the pain exists in you, it's only an appearance. So what you're actually doing is contributing to your facade, not actually removing it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. You're actually helping your facade develop further rather than removing it. Once we address the real underlying pain and feel the underlying pain, we, there's no need to be mindful anymore. It's, uh, we now automatically engage the new behaviour, which is sharing or being yourself without feeling embarrassed and without feeling like you've got to apologise for it. Does that make sense? Uh, I, f I, I am still in that addiction myself where I often apologise for being who I am. Does that make sense? So it's something that I've ha had to spend a fair bit of time on, trying to find the underlying pain-based emotion that causes me to do that. You follow? Yeah. And that, that's the secret, to find the actual underlying causal emotion that drives the behaviour rather than being mindful of changing the behaviour. So yeah. I've, had, uh, I've, I've learned that you give up being mindful of changing the behaviour and focus more attention on finding the, the cause of that behaviour emotionally and releasing that emotion. If you can release that emotion, then... It's really wonderful then, you know, you, it's, it's an automatic change in you and, you and you don't have to worry about it anymore. You don't even have to think about it anymore. It's not like something you're going to have to be mindful of the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like it's preferable to go into my mind and have some sort of control of it. And, and also, it's preferable to feel like I, I'm bad than to feel actually people might attack me for who I am. Yes, it is. And that's what I've found myself is that that's the reason why I was doing it. Um. It was easier to, for me to treat myself badly and get the agreement of others doing it than it is to treat myself well and now have other people's attack have other people attack me for doing that. So you know, so it was all about fear of attack. Yeah. You know, for me, a lot, a lot of it. There's other things too. But can you see what you were attempting to do is actually contributing to a facade, a bigger facade? Yeah. Yeah. And and it's actually a very, um, you know. It's the opposite direction that you want to go. Yeah, what you want to do is get to the pain and release that. So, so there's no need for being mindful. No need for ha making a bigger facade in order to control something. Yeah. 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 yeah thank you. Yeah, a good question. Yep. Yeah. Um, where are we up to? Anyone else? Uh, if we come across to Cecily. Jesus, can you explain this statement, please, that some soul development may also seem to happen due to the engagement of activity? Well, um, the way God's constructed the universe is a very good question, and uh, I'm surprised no one's actually asked it up to now. But, but the way God's constructed the universe is very interesting because what God's done is, is, in, is engaged quite a lot of laws that where as soon as we take any action of any kind or even inaction, there's a law that we're confronting automatically. Does that make sense? So there's a whole heap of laws that operate automatically upon us no matter what we do. And those laws are there to help us develop. 
in love, to help us grow in love. And so this is how initially many spirits who are progressing on the natural love paths finish up progressing because there's a whole heap of laws that actually encourage the progression in natural love by the operation of the law being that they feel some pain if they break the law and they feel some pleasure when, it, when they engage the law. And so they naturally then start to learn that these laws are in operation all the time. Now, that's different than purposefully engaging a law. Does that make sense? So there, there are many laws that you right now are engaging without any thought. So gravity is probably a law that you're engaging without a thought, a physical law. But there's also emotional laws that you're engaging without a thought, right? without knowing that you are. Now, those laws have been created to encourage a person towards love. Right? And those kind of laws are always going to be present. And that's why we need to have a discussion about law so you understand the types of laws that are, of, that are in the universe and, and how they're engaged. Now, there's two types of laws. There's a type of law that you automatically engage whether you're conscious or ignorant or not. You know, It doesn't matter, ignorance or consciousness, you're engaging the law and there's going to be a result. And you have the choice of measuring the result or not even. But, but the measure is always happiness, means that I'll probably be drawn into doing that more, more frequently, right? Now, if you were taken out of the world and just kept in isolation, you would actually find that the engagement of these laws would be almost automatic and you wouldn't even know what the laws are, but you'd feel some pleasure when you did something and some pain when you did the other and you'd be naturally gravitating towards where the pleasure is taking you. Does that make sense? That's how God's designed the universe. But, but unfortunately on earth we're, we're not rewarded for things that God was rewarding us for. So it gets a bit confusing on earth. But if you were in isolation, this was what would happen. Now that is different from you actually knowing what a law is and knowing how to engage it. Does that make sense? So that's like me now having an experiment with the law of gravity and I work out everything about the law. So, you know, I dropped the balls initially. This was what happened. We dropped balls of bigger, small size, bigger size, and they hit the ground at the same time. Now that tells me, oh... There must be the same force operating upon the big thing and the small thing, otherwise they wouldn't hit the ground at the same time. Initially it was thought that if you drop two things and one was lighter and the other was heavier, that they'd hit the ground at different... Sorry, if one was bigger and one was smaller, they'd hit the ground at different times. But then they did us some experiments and they found, no, it's at the same time, so there must be the same force. And eventually we got to measuring the force. Now that's a person now knowing the law... And once they know the law, they can do a heap of mathematical calculations and send a rocket up to break the law of gravity, to get out of gravity into space. Right? That's how. So they're trying. They're now. They're now working. What laws are needed to oppose the law of gravity so that we can work with gravity and get out of the control of gravity? So that's an example of a person engaging a law with knowledge. Now, for the majority of us, we're engaging laws left, right and centre with no knowledge. But we also have the choice of engaging laws with knowledge, where we can actually work out what the law is, define what the law is, and work out how it works. And then purposefully, using our will, purposefully engage it. Yep. And this is what you can do with laws like law of repentance, law of forgiveness, the higher laws of God. And you're going to have to do it with those higher laws because they're not automatic. They don't automatically operate. There's the, the, or you could say there's an automatic denial of operation until you engage it, until you use your will to engage the operation. Thanks. That explains why you wrote seem to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Difference in awareness. Unawareness as opposed to developing an awareness. Correct. So one, one is having an awareness of the law in its complete detail or to a degree and the other is having no awareness but it's still operating, still operating. We're just in ignorance of it but we're still getting the results of it. Yeah, yep. thank you. Yep. Okay, how are we time-wise? We're all right, One more question in Marion. In between now and learning about the laws, yep. to activate 
God's laws that we don't know the details of but have a feeling for, mm-hmm. like maybe the laws of love, grace, mercy, desire, yeah. do we just long for God's love when we're doing an action so as to enact those laws, so to engage those laws? Well, to a degree you've already been told from a verbal, we've had a verbal conversation about how to embrace the law of divine love, for example, how to receive God's love. You've been told how to do that. But still most of you are not engaging the law because it's not driven by a heartfelt desire of the real self. Do you see what I'm saying? So we're still in opposition of to engaging the law even though we intellectually know what the law is. So it's quite false to believe that I may be engaging some of those things if I'm working in a facade and avoiding my pain. Correct. Okay. So what we need to do first is we need to deconstruct a lot of this before we can develop a sincere desire in our heart to engage that law. That's very different than just having an idea, isn't it, in our head and going ahead with that. We need to have some sincerity from the heart for to engage a lot of these higher laws of the soul. And, and in order to do that, th- this stuff here causes our insincerity. So, so you can see that, and, and God's not going to destroy these things because because we created them. So God's not going to destroy them. We created them. We're going to need to destroy them in order to gain some sincerity. So, that, so the hard part, and this, is, this was said in the pageant messages frequently, the hard part is making a start. The hard part's making a start. Because making a start requires a sincere feeling. And sincere feelings are not the domain of the facade. The facade is very insincere. And then also making a start requires harmony with truth. But the pain is not harmonious with truth. The pain believes all its lies. So it's not harmonious with truth. So it's very hard to make a start while at, at while we are in our current state because our facade is living the lie and believing all these things that are untrue and the pain is living the lie, believing all these things that are untrue and, and, and the facade is obviously insincere and we're going to need sincerity before we can engage a lot of these higher laws. So you can see that it's not just a simple matter of going, I'm going to long for God's love and I'm going to receive because, because the reality is it's highly likely when we begin that the longing is not even sincere. So, so it could be just spirits helping me, um, helping me with my pretense that I'm shifting because my law of attraction is changing in things. But yeah, but it's not um, just spirits, Marion. It, it's a, it's a feeling that most of us have. See, the reason one of the reasons why we love our facade is because it tells us we're doing something when we're not. Does that make sense? So, so what it does is it helps us to feel like we're making progress when we're not really. So we've got to make sh- the law of attraction will cause major changes when we make progress. We know that, right? We can measure progress through the changes from the attractions, but but for the majority of us, there's little or no major progress in the changes, and and while that's happening, we know we're not making actual change yet. And then if we start making changes, where you see little parts changing, initially this is what happens. You start seeing little ch- attraction differences occur and they're not spe- fed by spirits trying to fool you or anything. They're actual events so that are repeatable. And, and as a result of that, you start then f- getting a little bit of motivation to deconstruct this and get more sincerity and deal with this pain more. And then as that happens, we've got a building sincere desires may you know occasionally sincere you know might be sincere you know like uh, Deidre mentioned a few uh, yesterday I think it was when you talked about oh, I had a sincere desire in 2009 you even knew when you did but have one and and this is the thing is and then certain things may happen that turn it off and we've got to address those things that turn it off so but making the start is the hardest part because because there's so much momentum in the opposite direction. Yeah, realising the truth of where we actually are. <laughs> yes. So, so you can see, going back to the first two days, recognising and accepting that facade, a very important part of the process. 
Yeah. Even more so than I realise. <laughs> kind of, like of course. <laughs> it's always going to be like that, isn't it? This facade is not going to realise a whole heap of things. And it's only after we talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and we try and explain the details of it, and you get some truth about it, that you go, oh, there's a lot of work there. <laughs> there's a lot of work there to be done. And there is. You know, the reality is for the average person on this planet, as we've talked about, you know, we've got a whole, you know, this, this is a, like a huge construction, like a castle, isn't it? Really? I was Queen Nefertiti two days ago. I Sorry? was I was Queen Nefertiti. What does that mean? I, I thought I was reincarnated. So oh, I really? slipped into a full delusion yeah, for the day okay. because my facade is so strong. Yeah. My resistance to the facade is so strong. So I slipped into a delusion yeah. and was telling... Dave, he was King Solomon. <laughs> and, and then the next morning I'm like, oh, my God. What did I just it do? Yeah. <laughs> what did I just do? Yeah, delusions, like serious spirit-fed delusions. About, yes. And because that, there's and so much terror of that facade. And that's also the result of the will needing to have some validation from, you know, to be special and unique. And, oh, extreme. Yeah, all those <laughs> things. Yeah. 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 No, that's good. Okay, well, let's uh, finish there. Let's have a uh, half an hour break now. So we're coming back at quarter to two. Sound all right to you? And we'll get started on the last part of our group. <laughs>